Good afternoon. I'm Rafael Reif, MIT's president number 17. To all of Paul's friends and colleagues, to the great family, and to our beloved Priscilla, it's an honor to open the celebration of Paul's remarkable life. All of us are gathered here because of Paul. But in a larger sense, I must point out that I'm here at MIT because of him. And that may be true for many of you, too. For me, it's because in the 1980s, MIT was in a fierce competition with other top academic institutions for leadership in electrical engineering. As president, Paul understood that MIT urgently needed to create what we ended up calling MTL, the Microsystems Technology Laboratories. Launching MTL had the important effect of keeping MIT at the front, front, forefront of the field. And incidentally, it kept me here on the faculty. So I'm a direct beneficiary of Paul's clear vision an exceptional ability to get things done. As you can see from your programs, our speakers today and the program itself explore many dimensions of Paul's life story. So I will not attempt to capture it myself. Instead, I will reflect on a few lessons he taught us all through the eloquence of his example. We all know that Paul held just about every job at MIT, <laughs> including, finally, the chairman of the corporation. After that, he went back to the job he loved the most, teaching. Naturally, he returned to his home discipline, electrical engineering. At the time, the associate department head for electrical engineering was some microelectronics professor from Venezuela named Rafael Reif. Paul would always come to my office at the start of the semester. This MIT legend, president and then chairman, and he would ask me what I wanted him to teach. I would always say, Paul, what would you like to teach? And he would always choose 6002, circuits and electronics. That's the first academic subject in electrical engineering. Paul used to say that it was like learning to play the scales for musicians. It's the foundation of everything, he would say. But looking back now, I realize what I should have said. I should have asked Paul to teach me how he managed to lead his life with such remarkable integrity. Of course, Paul was profoundly honest. He lived by the highest ethical and moral standards. But the integrity, I mean, went beyond that. Paul was, as a person, integrated, unified, of a peace, like an integrated circuit. There was a moral unity to his whole life, a unity of purpose and values. He knew who he was down to the core. That gave him deep personal confidence in every situation. And it gave everyone else perfect confidence that he would always do the right thing. And he always did. Over time, I had the opportunity to ask Paul for all kinds of advice. To be a new provost or president here, facing your first big crisis, and to have his counsel, it was a gift. All of us who came after him in those jobs felt incredibly fortunate to know him. And there may never have been a better manager of a university than Paul Gray. His memory on every issue and his knowledge of the budget 
or humbling. I must tell you, though, that the best advice he ever gave me about how to handle being president was, don't eat dessert. <laughs> I believe the most important thing Paul taught by his example was how to succeed at creating change. At a place like MIT, with such a legacy of excellence, persuading people that things need to change is a non-trivial exercise. But Paul understood this community so well. He knew how to lead MIT to live up to its full potential. And he also had the patience for a lot of meetings. As a result, more than anyone I can think of, Paul shaped the MIT we know today. When you think of the programs and progress he helped create, it's impossible to imagine MIT without them. Where would we be without our undergraduate research opportunities program or Europe? How did first-year students ever manage without pass, no record? Would MIT even be MIT if we did not welcome talented people from every background and did not turn outward to engage the world? Each of these developments represented, at the time, serious, startling change. But Paul helped our community to see that each of these steps was the bright, open path to possibility. I close with one final Paul Gray lesson. As a white male who arrived when the institute itself was overwhelmingly white and male, Paul was not an obvious candidate to lead MIT into a new era of diversity. But as we will hear today, he certainly did. And through that work, he proved something extremely important, that in the life of our community, cultural change and moral growth are possible and imperative. In this complex, confusing time for our nation and therefore for our community, may Paul be, as he always was, our guide to inventing a better future for all. Good afternoon. I'm Shirley Ann Jackson, the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a member of the MIT classes of 1968 and 1973, and a life member of the MIT Corporation. First, I want to thank Paul's wife, Priscilla, all of his family, and President Raphael Reif for inviting me to join this celebration of the life of Paul Gray today. I admired and loved Paul Gray, as did all of us. He was someone I turned to throughout my career whenever I had a difficult decision to make because I knew that he would guide me towards the right end. But beyond that, I've always felt an enormous sense of kinship with Paul because we shared important moments of leadership together. When I was an undergraduate at MIT, I was one of just two African-American women in my class. It was a lonely, chilly experience, and although I was a good student, I was not entirely accepted by my classmates or even by some of my professors. In the spring of 1968, I was deciding among graduate schools, and I was on the way to the airport after a visit to the University of Pennsylvania, when I learned that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. Inspired by the courage and sacrifice of Dr. King and others 
in the civil rights movement, I realized that MIT needed to become a more welcoming place for African Americans, for women, for people from all backgrounds and origins. And given its, its outsized influence in science and engineering, when you change MIT, you change the world. Now, at the time, there were very few African-American faculty members or administrators to spearhead such an effort. So a group of like-minded students and I formed the Black Students' Union, and we presented a list of demands to the MIT administration. Only we called them proposals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, in response, MIT formed the Task Force on Educational Opportunity to address the embedded issues. In its infinite wisdom, MIT asked Paul Gray, uh, who soon became associate provost, to take charge of the response. Now, Paul always said that this was his first real chance to exercise leadership of any form at MIT, and that's a quote. And he quickly demonstrated that he was a true leader, exactly the right mature person for a turbulent time. He took what could have been an adversarial situation, and sometimes it was, and instantly identified our shared objectives. And although he was MIT through and through, he immediately grasped that MIT could and should be better. I was invited to join the Task Force on Educational Opportunity, which I did during my first year of graduate school here at MIT. I had decided that I needed to remain at MIT for graduate school because I knew that it was important to work to change things here, and I felt that I could make a difference. Now, until that moment, so Paul tells me, he had told me, I feel like he's still here, Paul had never had the opportunity before to get to know any African Americans. Having grown up in an all-white community, gone to an all-white high school, and served in an all-white unit of the Army. But importantly, he was an empathetic person who could always pull something up from inside himself to find common ground with the person sitting across from him. As a teenager with an intense interest in amateur radio and electronics, he had felt like an outsider. He had some insight, therefore, into how difficult that could be. So he was ready to listen, to learn, and to act. Thanks to Paul, the Task Force on Educational Opportunity spurred a breathtaking change at MIT. Until then, MIT had not done much recruiting of any kind for students, but why would it? It was MIT, after all. But under Paul's leadership, MIT hired an assistant director of admissions who was African American. For the first time, the institute developed special recruiting materials and a stronger financial aid package and began visiting predominantly African American high schools saying to the most talented young men and women there, we want you at MIT. Paul also had the wisdom to send the Black Students Union students, including me, on as many of these recruiting trips as we could manage amidst our studies to prove to African American high schoolers that MIT was indeed a realistic possibility. We had convince Paul that merely bringing underrepresented minorities to MIT was not enough, because some of their high schools did not offer advanced science and mathematics. So they would be starting in what I had called an Olympic-level race from meters behind. They needed an introduction to the rigorous coursework of MIT and to become confident that they could succeed here. So the task force also initiated Project Interphase, which continues to this day. Project Interphase was an intense six-week summer program for incoming freshmen who needed it, with classes in physics and pre-calculus, among other subjects, and a wonderful introduction to the MIT culture. I taught physics in Interphase, and although I was still a graduate student, I was asked to run the physics program in its second year. 
As you can imagine, these were radical changes for MIT in the late 1960s. Paul was criticized initially by some faculty members who thought that he was lowering the quality of the student body. And some of my peers called me a collaborationist for working so closely with the white administration. Now, Paul was even addressed in a derogatory and profane fashion by some very angry African-American students on one occasion. But Paul was always cool-headed, even the, in the most heated times. And he was tough when he knew he was right. The students pe Paul helped to bring to MIT thrived and proved not just to MIT, but to the nation, that brilliance in science and engineering is not the province of any single background, ethnicity, or place of origin. That experience of working with Paul taught me first what leadership is. He also taught me that I was a leader, and it led to many other opportunities for me throughout my life and career, for which I am immensely grateful. Paul also taught me by example that leadership requires toughness, tenacity, and importantly, a willingness to be a bit of a collaborationist. In other words, to listen to others, to identify points of intersection, and to work to turn opponents into supporters. Paul, as all of you know, went on to become chancellor, creating the first formal plan to increase the presence of women and minorities among the faculty as well as the student body. He then became the 14th president of MIT and later the chair of the MIT Corporation. And as you have heard, Paul changed the MIT experience in many important ways throughout his career, including modernizing the electrical engineering curriculum for the age of semiconductors in the early 1960s and championing a radical idea that President Reif referenced, the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program in the late 1960s at the behest of and in collaboration with Margaret McVicker, who also happened to be my physics tutor uh, early in my career in the women's dorm. Importantly, Paul and Priscilla, as partners, worked to make MIT a more welcoming place in myriad ways for everyone here, especially the students. Paul always cited increasing the diversity of MIT as his most important accomplishment. And as you know, when he arrived as an undergraduate, fewer than one in 50 MIT under students was a woman or an underrepresented minority. And by the end of his tenure as president in 1990, women were more than 30% of the incoming classes and underrepresented minorities, 14%. Now, Paul truly changed the world as an educational innovator and by paving the way for the rest of us who continue to work to bring the full complement of young talent into science and engineering. But it was not just the institutional Paul Gray, but the personal Paul Gray, who was so important in my life. He was a sounding board, mentor, supporter, and friend throughout my career. We often talked about the importance of education for our national well-being, especially in science and engineering, and about pedagogical innovation. Importantly, at crucial points of decision and opportunity in my life, I could always turn to Paul and did for advice and counsel Moreover, he was my greatest direct and personal advocate for important positions, including the chairmanship of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the presidency of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. In fact, when I was developing the Rensselaer Plan, our strategic blueprint, Paul came to the university to help to explain to our board of trustees the crucial linkage of research and teaching in educating young people in science and engineering. And because of that, it was a great honor to have Paul write the foreword to a book that was a retrospective of my first 10 years as president of Rensselaer. 
So it was a great privilege to have shared a particular period in history with Paul Gray and to have made something happen alongside him. And later on my own with his support and friendship. It was a privilege, in fact, just to have known him. Paul was kind. He was sensible. He had moral courage. And he grew into a dear friend. And I will always cherish the long talks and walks we had when my husband Morris and I would visit Paul and Priscilla in Rhode Island, often in the winter, and our hunts for the crustaceans that Priscilla loved so much. I'm so grateful to Paul Gray for teaching me so much and for his incredible grace. I will miss him for the rest of my life. I thank all of you for allowing me to honor this great man. Priscilla and members of the Gray family, Raphael and members of the MIT community, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Victor Fung. I'm from Hong Kong. I am uh, from MIT class of 66. And Paul Gray was my thesis advisor for my master's thesis. I can't tell you what a great honor and privilege it is for me to speak at this service for an MIT legend whose life and humanity touched all of us. Paul Gray's belief in diversity and inclusion, as borne out by Shirley Jackson's brilliant achievements, also benefited me when I was a 20-year-old MIT student from Hong Kong. Indeed, some 50 years ago, Paul wrote me a letter that has since been a guiding light for my entire career. It was 1966, and I was doing a thesis for my master's in electrical engineering. In fact, I was blessed to be the last thesis student Professor Gray mentored before going full-time into administration. It was most gracious of him to take me on as he was already extremely busy as Associate Dean for Student Affairs. Paul set aside an hour every week out of his very busy schedule. And if my memory serves me correctly, it was 4 p.m. every Thursday for me to come to his office so that he could guide and review my progress. I still remember his office was on the fourth door on the beginning of the infinite corridor as you go in on 77 Mass Ave. I must confess, I was not always punctual nor was my attendance entirely reliable. I think I might have missed one or two times. I was doing a co-op program at General Radio during the day and then working on my thesis at night. But keeping a dean waiting was not the smartest thing that I have ever done. <laughs> the thesis was about computer-aided design of Schmidt trigger circuits, very technical. In fact, I read the thesis again recently, and I couldn't believe that was what I wrote. <laughs> when I finished, Paul wrote me a five-page letter. The gist was, based on the quality and content of the work in your thesis, I'm giving you an A. But I want you to know that I'm giving you this A reluctantly. The way you plan and structure your work and your interaction with me do not deserve an A. <laughs> of course, I told my parents in Hong Kong only about the grade. <laughs> I didn't dare tell them about the letter. But as I started my career, Paul's treasure letter gave me much food for thought. I have reread it many, many times over the years. Paul really impressed upon me that having the bright idea is not enough. You've got to have the discipline to put those ideas into a context where they can be effective. If you wish to end up with a final piece or a final product that is truly excellent, 
you have got to execute properly. I'm sure each and every one of you here today have been touched by this wonderful individual at some point in your careers and in his own very special way. That is not all that I've learned from Paul. In him, I found a man whose values resonate deeply with those of my own family. Commitment, loyalty, fairness, and I have just indicated frankness. Paul also cared passionately that techni technological change should be a force for good in communities and societies globally, an ethos which continues to inspire and drive our own family company, Li and Fung, today. Long ago, on one of Paul's many visits to Hong Kong as MIT president, he asked if I would consider making a meaningful donation to this institute. I explained that I couldn't at the time because I was putting every cent I had into a buyout of the family company. But I made a commitment that when I did have the means, I would be back. Imagine then what a joy it was to see Paul and Priscilla at last year's ceremony announcing MIT's new makerspace at the Metropolitan Warehouse, which my brother William and I are honored to support. It was the last time I saw Paul. I so wanted Paul to know that the seed he planted years ago had ripened for reasons that include my lifelong gratitude to him and to MIT. When he became my mentor, Paul was only 34 years old, younger than my children are today. Yet the serious, proper man always seemed wiser than his years, just as he was years ahead of his time. Paul was truly the master who appeared when the student was ready. He helped me formulate my life and what to make of it. For sure, I shall be keeping that letter of his safely under lock and key for future generations of my family. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Taylor. I sometimes respond to the description of the younger brother that Paul never had and the older brother that Virginia never had. In 1965, I was a senior at MIT and looking for a way to finance graduate school and avoid the Vietnam War. Providentially, Ken Wadley, then Dean of Student Affairs, was bringing on board a new associate dean and needed a grunt to do some work in the, uh, with respect to the freshman curriculum. Paul Gray, an untenured professor of electrical engineering, became that associate dean, and I was the grunt. Between us, over the next 18 months, we uh, did some work around the freshman program, which resulted in some changes. But more importantly, we established a lifelong friendship that can never be replaced. Paul became my role model. Now, role model can take many forms, and I've come to believe that there are at least four elements to being a role model. I call them the four Fs, faith, fitness, family, and profession. And to search for somebody that embodies all of those is very difficult. Many people never find that, but I was fortunate enough and to both find it and recognize it early on. So Paul became the standard by which I've measured much of the uh, remainder of my life. I won't say a lot about the professional element. Paul's 47 years at MIT, the, uh, what he called this special place, has been well documented, will be well described by other people. But I would like to just talk quickly about the project that we worked on together because it was actually the first thing that Paul did in an administrative capacity to benefit MIT. 
through the mid-60s, uh, the freshman curriculum was absolutely identical for all freshmen. Chemistry, physics, math, humanities, absolutely the same courses taught in the same way, regardless of the high school student preparation, or regardless of academic intention. And Paul was asked the question, is that the way it ought to be? So we did some studies on that. Um, we had some hypotheses to test. For example, I, I call these intuitively obvious. I'm not sure why we had to analyze them. But uh, for example, if a student in high school had had calculus, would they do better in calculus and physics at MIT than if they hadn't had calculus? That seemed pretty obvious, but we needed to analyze that, and bring some data to bear on it, come up with some conclusions. So um, we had a lot of data on freshman classes, and we had state-of-the-art computing. The state-of-the-art computing in 1965 was an IBM 1402 and an IBM 84. It's unlikely that most of you know what those numbers be, but it's actually a punch card reader and a card sorter. That is what we use for uh, computing support. Needless to say, our analytical work um, verify that there should be some changes in the freshman program, that it needn't be monolithic and totally structured the same way for all students. And as a result of that, MIT implemented some variations in chemistry, physics, especially physics and math, uh, and permitted students to take variations depending on their academic uh, interests and future. What I learned from that was not, not only the, uh, what I would call almost the obvious conclusions, but more importantly, the way Paul approached complex problems. Uh, his clarity of thought was incredible. His integrity, his mutual respect for others, including his grunt, uh, just came through in that project and set, set standards for my own professional career. I mentioned the faith element briefly. Paul didn't talk much about his faith. He simply lived it. He was a longtime member at Hancock Church in Lexington, where Priscilla still worships. They were active in a small group Bible study for more than 50 years. They traveled together, socialized, but mostly studied the Bible. I marvel at how he served in key positions and key committees at his church while fulfilling demanding jobs at MIT. Fitness and its companion food represented a wide area for Paul and me to explore together. We played squash intensely, and I learned not to take control of the tee when Paul was behind me. I learned the significance of the phrase, coming around. <laughs> Paul taught me to drink my coffee black, how to enjoy butter in every nook and cranny of English muffins. <laughs> we love Priscilla's lobster boils, lasagna, and her sticky buns. We shared Thanksgiving dinners in the president's house. We ate Tex-Mex in Corpus Christi, where our son, Paul's namesake, was born more than 40 years ago. We suffered the same sweet tooth for cookies and ice cream. When I took up running, Paul tried to convince me that rice at Royal East was an acceptable form of carb loading before the Boston Marathon. He was wrong. <laughs> in our early days, we hiked the White Mountains with Virginia and Amy, and in recent years, we walked slowly around Walden Pond. But for me, Paul's most significant impact was through his dedication to his family. When you got to know Paul, you got the whole family. His parents sent him off from Livingston, New Jersey, to MIT, and were always a bit puzzled as to why he never left. Shortly after I started working for Paul, I met Priscilla, his partner in all things. Virginia was a precocious eight-year-old pushing the boundaries. Amy was a fine arts talent, especially creative in fabric and textiles. Andrew was Paul's buddy, trying out new things, including each other's patients. And Louise was then and now the pixie, the center of impish fun. Our lives have intertwined ever since. As I witnessed family life for the Grays, it followed a few simple principles. Spend time together, be serious, have fun, be deliberate about creating memories, celebrate together, grieve together, never compromise your integrity. 
easy to say, hard to put into practice. And it does sound nearly perfect, but I'll admit I had to do a little bit of fine tuning. I had to rescue his children from the monotony of Mozart by introducing them to Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. <laughs> You'll hear a lot about Paul's legacy today, but for me it's pretty personal. It sustains me in the areas of faith, fitness, family, and profession. I'd like to think that I'm a better person for having traveled in Paul's wake. And I hope that's been passed down to some degree to my children and grandchildren. But multiply that by thousands. I dare say nearly everybody here. We've all woven a thread of Paul Gray into our lives. That's his lasting legacy. A year ago, in one of my visits to see Priscilla and Paul, He wanted to make a special breakfast on the day I was leaving to return home. He asked the night before what I'd like, and I said, I really like the omelets he made in Little Compton with Swiss cheese and fresh chives. That struck him as doable. So the next morning, after about an hour of scurrying around in the kitchen, he proudly presented breakfast, delicious blueberry pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a touching moment equal parts sweet and sad. I miss Paul.
It was my privilege 26 years ago to award you your bachelor's degree and 25 years ago your master's degree. It was soon recognized that your first-rate performance as a teacher was matched by first-rate talent as an administrator. And you were quickly co-opted from one administrative job after another. In fact, you hardly had the opportunity to arm the chair in one post before you were drafted for another. It's very nice to have so many people from so many institutions and so many old friends who have come back today to back participate today. in this celebration. I got to know Paul Gray when I was beginning graduate school. But uh, we really became close when I became his provost. I first met him through his deep involvement in undergraduate education at MIT. He was a great friend, a great colleague, but also a very great teacher for me. I got involved as an athlete, as a swimmer, as a rower, as a sailor, and I would often see him and I would invite him to our competitions. And he would come. And I remember he and Priscilla coming into a swimming meet and just sitting down and staying for the whole time. He was a quietly very brave, tenacious man, loving and kind and gentle and very focused and always very engaged. He loved being around experts and taking advice from experts and learning from experts and sharing with experts. He was the father who took us hiking, biking, swimming, sailing, skating. He's the one who ran behind us when we were learning to ride our bikes until we could do it on our own. And there were no training wheels. We just figured it out. Paul began his MIT life as a freshman. Paul came to MIT in 1950, so that's almost 70 years. That's just simply remarkable. I cannot think of anybody else who gave so much of his life, who shared so much of his life with this institute. He's a very down-to-earth individual, very straightforward man, but very caring. He did so much for MIT, and he did it loyally. He did it morning, noon, and night. He was so devoted to this place and to the students in such a genuine way. He was never in it for himself. He was always in it for MIT. Some years ago, in a commencement in the rain, a father was heard to say, after the soaking I've taken for the last four years, who minds a little rain? <clears throat> but I have to say, this is something else. In the competitive sport of diving, the various dives are ranked according to the degree of difficulty. When the performances of different divers are equal, the diver who chooses the dive with the highest degree of difficulty wins. Now, by that measure alone, you here today are winners. You have chosen and successfully negotiated a collegiate education, having what may be the nation's highest degree of difficulty. You know, we always called it this special place. And I think for him, it really was a special place and a kind of home unlike he'd ever had before because it satisfied him intellectually and it satisfied him, I think, emotionally. And when he was able to connect his own family to it, then I think that that was sort of a full circle. MIT is best known for the scientists and engineers who have studied there. He was at MIT at a time when engineering changed completely from a largely empirical practice of making things and making them work to a situation where science and understanding fundamentals affected the design and the implementation of so many systems. This very gentle, quiet, fierce man I know had to do battle uh, to get Whitehead Institute established. People were terribly suspicious 
And, you know, frankly, he wasn't sure what it would be. Nobody was. Uh, it was an experiment, and he took the risk. MIT and the biomedical enterprise in Kendall Square is unrivaled anywhere in the world. And so I do credit Paul with setting us out in that direction. So the Whitehead, we now have the Broad and the Reagan, the Koch Institute, any number of expressions of the power of biology to transform our world. When I came to MIT, which was in 1965, I think maybe two or three percent of the students were women, fewer than that on the faculty. It was very much a male institution. He was tremendously committed to diversity, increasing the representation in the faculty and in the student body of women and of minorities. The number of entering African-American students at MIT went from about three to five per year to 57. To this day, I mean, we're just very proud of that momentum that Paul brought to the table on this issue. MIT has a responsibility to itself and to the nation to be open and indeed to reach out to the most talented and promising people, regardless of race or sex. None of us created all the bias around us, but we certainly inherit it. And what I love about President Gray is that he stepped right into that. And as soon as he saw it and understood it, he decided to actually do something about it. During his inauguration, what he wanted as the walking in music was Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man. And that was him, you know. He always was in touch with his very modest beginnings in a blue collar family where, you know, the economy was a challenge. One of his fraternity brothers while he was at MIT as a sophomore was dating a woman at Wheaton College where my mother was a freshman. They introduced my parents on what turned out to be a rather successful blind date. It was very cold and uh, they're walking across the bridge and my mother doesn't have any gloves. And my father said, I've got a pair of gloves, why don't we do this? I'll wear the left one, you wear the right one, and we'll hold hands to keep the middle ones warm. And they walked across the bridge and they walked off into the future. That was the first day of their relationship. I thought, well, that's, that's pretty good for a nerd from New Jersey. A very clever use of a pair of gloves to win the girl's heart. It was the big blizzard of 78, and no cars were allowed on the road, you know, for a week, but MIT was not gonna shut down. So we started this bus line, and one of my favorite pictures of Paul Gray is with his big wolf skin or beaver skin hat, you know, with like a Russian hat, out in the parking lot at MIT where the buses came in, directing traffic. I mean, he was very much hands-on. He looks incredibly happy, actually, in the picture. He was just doing what he could do, I think, and having fun doing it. I think he had a lot of joy in what he did. He was a real proponent of the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program, Europe. It was dramatically successful and found a way for undergraduates to interact with the faculty in their research project. This would be a way in which students could, for the first time perhaps in their years at MIT, come to terms with an unsolved real problem, something where they could make a genuine contribution. That became an integral part of how MIT educates students, so it was a huge thing for us. When he finished up all the administrative and leadership roles that he had at MIT, he went back to the classroom. He loved being in the classroom. You turn the crank on a three by three matrix, and solve for the node voltages, E sub B, E sub C, and E sub D. He was an absolutely excellent teacher. Clarity, 
complete concern with the students' understanding, uh, very much enjoyed being in their company. Professor Gray was uh, my ad academic advisor uh, when I was an undergrad here at MIT, and I remember he was a really warm, very friendly, giving advisor. At first, maybe you would think it might be a little intimidating having your advisor be the ex-president of MIT, but that turned out not to be the case at all. Professor Gray was extremely down to earth. He really understood technological education and what a, a technological research university is really about and how precious it is. One of the many involvements that the Grays had with students were the senior dinners. We invited the whole class to dinner, 60 or 70 at a time. All of us at MIT, we just celebrate the opportunities to be with those students. They are so special. Every semester on registration day, we would meet with him, and then that evening, all of us, all of his advisees, would go out to dinner with him, always at the Royal East. If you can imagine, there was sort of a, a big table, usually in the back of the restaurant, all filled with, um, I'd say maybe about 10 or so advisees. Yours is the obligation to help heal this society where healing is required, to help strengthen the nations where strengthening is required, and to help bring harmony among the nations of this world wherever discord obtains. If you have ever seen Paul's official presidential portrait, it is a portrait of Paul and Priscilla. He was the first person to have his spouse in the picture, right? And I think that for him, that was a measure of his devotion for her, his appreciation for all the things that my mother may have sacrificed in order to help him have the roles and the opportunities that he had and all the ways in which she supported him. I think that that was his way of saying, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do this without Priscilla. It was extraordinary to watch them together, how they worked together, how they supported each other. They both had a twinkle in their eye that would kind of ping at you. Just to know that there was someone sort of watching over us, making sure that things generally are probably going to be okay for us. So I really appreciated that very much. He is a man of exceptional integrity. The humanness of the man and of Priscilla was so essential to the kind of leadership he provided at MIT. He cared about people. A person with tremendous integrity, a person with tremendous wisdom, um, thoughtful, calm. An extraordinarily forceful person, but also with a surprisingly gentle personality. He was good at listening. He was good at negotiating and meeting people part way. And he was good at imagining what might be possible if this shifted or that changed or we could move forward together in this direction. As you undertake this next stage in your lives, I wish for you a life that is rich in opportunities to stretch your talents, your interests, your imagination, and your vision of this small planet as a beautiful oasis generating peace. And as you depart from this special place, I wish you Godspeed. That was a remarkable, remarkable tribute. I'm Susan Hockfield, and I served as the 16th president of MIT. And it is a very great, but a very sad privilege to offer a few words in celebration of the 14th president of MIT, Paul E. Gray. I first met Paul Gray during my initial introduction to MIT Paul served as a member of the Presidential Search Committee that brought me to the Institute. Even among the truly impressive and distinguished committee members, Paul, by any measure, held the deepest knowledge and the greatest breadth of understanding of MIT. However, even among that group, 
with that task at hand, he demonstrated one of his core characteristics, doing far more listening than speaking. In those interviews and first conversations, I came to understand that Paul's patience as a listener captured the essential trait of the greatest teachers, a remarkable skill in leading us, his students, to discover the answers ourselves. When I arrived on campus as the Institute's newly minted president, Paul became my first and most essential guide to MIT. His love of the place, of the people, and of our mission shone brightly in all he said and all he did. As my family joined our new community, he and his beloved Priscilla warmly adopted us, giving Tom, Elizabeth, and me a profoundly appreciated sense of being at home. A part of me has always and will always see MIT through Paul's eyes and through Priscilla's eyes, too. The two of them inseparably led MIT in head, hand, and heart. Paul, as we've heard again and again, transformed the Institute in a host of important ways. Looking through a particular set of lenses, one can see how it was he who paved the path that brought me to MIT as the Institute's first woman and first biologist to serve as president. As President Jackson has described so beautifully, Paul considered his work expanding opportunities for women and minorities to be his most important contribution. He understood deeply that for MIT to serve the nation and the world most effectively, we needed to bring more of the most talented people to our campus, no matter their gender or phenotype. He championed admitting more women and minority students and bringing greater diversity to our faculty and staff, not just in words, but also in deeds. The number of women students and faculty grew, and he appointed women to important roles. Margaret McVicker's leadership of the paradigm-breaking undergraduate research opportunities program, Europe, transformed a core tenant of the undergraduate experience. Through Europe, we invite our students to move beyond receiving knowledge in our classrooms to discovering knowledge in our laboratories. When Paul arrived as an undergraduate, his class included fewer than 2% women. When I arrived as MIT's president, over 45% of the entering freshmen were women. Paul had primed the institute for a woman president. In many critically important ways, Paul accelerated MIT's rise to world-class excellence in biology and fostered the remarkable development of the Kendall Square Innovation Cluster. Now, you might well accuse me of seeing the world through biology-tinted glasses, but 2020 hindsight shows clearly that Paul recognized early on the growing importance and long-range possibilities of the molecular biology revolution. The biology department had adopted this revolutionary way of studying the living world with a kind of monomania, propelling the institute to national and international leadership. Paul actively fostered the department's many offshoots. The Center for Cancer Research was launched when Paul was chancellor. And as president, he navigated the complex and sometimes vexed discussions that led to the establishment of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. In the words of Institute Professor Philip Sharp, Paul made the Whitehead happen. Paul provided a new building, of which there were not many during his presidency, for the biology department, and perhaps more significantly for MIT's definition of ourselves. He supported the adoption of the biology requirement for all undergraduates setting biology on equal footing among MIT's canonical triumvirate of physics, math, and chemistry. Taken together, Paul set conditions in place for the biological, biomedical, biotech explosion at MIT and in Kendall Square. And in this way, too, he primed the Institute for its first biologist president. Always the teacher, Paul orchestrated 
a magnificent gift to me in my first months on campus. He gathered his class of 54 colleagues and their newly donned cardinal jackets to meet me. Our dinner together taught me more about the tradition, devotion, and pride carried by MIT alumni than any abstract description could have done. As the adage about teaching goes, he didn't tell me, he showed me. Many who attended that dinner are here with us this afternoon, and I would say again what I said that evening. Thank you, Paul, for bringing us together in support of MIT's core values, the pursuit of truth, meritocracy, personal integrity, and service to others. And let me say again, for showing us, rather than telling us, these core values, we thank you, Paul. I am Gerald Wilson, and I served as Dean of Engineering while Paul was president. Each of us have memories of our interaction with Paul Gray and how he impacted our lives and our experience at MIT. I first saw Paul when he was a teaching assistant in a junior year subject I was taking. He was demonstrating electromechanical principles on a rotating machine in a Building 3 lecture hall. He was an early influence in the Department of Electrical Engineering. When electronics was transitioning from vacuum tube devices to semiconductor devices, he co-authored four of the seven texts, which were some of the earliest teaching tools that enabled that transition. Later, after he was president, he lectured a sophomore electronics subject. I remember his demonstrating negative feedback in a circuit and his pointing out that negative feedback, if used carefully, could be a positive factor in social situations as well. <laughs> his style, whether teaching in a formal classroom lecture or explaining his views on some administrative manner, was characterized, as you heard, by careful, methodical, and thoughtful descriptions. He was always approachable and receptive of questions. Even in a lecture hall with 200 students, the environment he engendered was one of sharing what he knew with many students engaging him after lecture to ask questions. He was a warm, dedicated, and effective teacher. Early on, Paul was looked to for his wisdom and advice. His careful, thoughtful, and earnest approach to a question was very often reflected in his facial expression. You could see his effort to provide a thoughtful response to your question, even in casual conversation. During the Vietnam War era, there was much protesting and anger among our students and our faculty. We had an AWOL soldier ensconced in the student center. 300 state and city police marched down Massachusetts Avenue in phalanx to confront students blocking employees in the instrumentation laboratory. Students occupied the president's office. Throughout, Paul was often a calming influence during this period. Seeking the best result for those involved, he focused on allowing protest without allowing it to destroy the institution. He was always approachable. He seemed to remember everyone he had met by name, whether a student, a research or support staff, or a faculty member. He encouraged people to call him Paul, putting aside titles. 
And that is how he was addressed by many, a measure how, of how he was viewed and trusted by the community. And with that, he engendered and nourished a sense of community that most everyone felt, a sense of belonging to a place that strived for excellence, a place you could trust. He was clearly a leader and behaved as one for whom the institution was deserving of only <clears throat> his best. He would carefully and promptly consider a proposal brought before him. Once he had made a decision to embrace an idea brought by others, he became their champion. Whether it was Europe to embrace our undergraduates' involvement in research, a new building for a department or school, a microelectronics center, a manufacturing initiative, a project to bring computers into the hands of students and faculty, establishing an institute for biological research in the face of considerable concern and controversy on the part of faculty. Once he was convinced that it had to be done, he put his own effort into it by helping to develop a strategy for, for a meeting with prospective donors. He was so much more than the approving executive. He was a hands-on supporter and builder of the initiative. One time, I had won his support for an initiative that was going to require $18 million in funding. Months later, I had to return to inform him that the cost was to double. I had expected a disappointed reaction, that's at least, and a question of whether we should proceed. Instead, he characterized it as unfortunate, but then went on to help me identify ways that could still make it happen. No recrimination, just support and help in creatively solving the problem. I always felt that he had my back. Paul had a consistent and deep concern for the experience that MIT provided for our undergraduate students. With Priscilla's strong involvement, he addressed significant issues that affected the undergraduate environment. Early on, as you heard, he became concerned that there were so few women in MIT's gradu under undergraduate population. He learned that the cause, in part, was a lack of adequate housing for women. Women's admissions were restricted due to the limited space of a women's dormitory over in Boston. He took action and removed that restriction and with a gift from Helen McCormick, provided significantly larger dormitory space for women. Paul also addressed MIT's lack of a strong minority contingent in the undergraduate class. Before he was the president, he aggressively worked with others to change our approach by seeking out and attracting minorities, not just waiting for them to apply. Changing our environment in this regard had its difficulties. We had to learn how to identify students who could succeed here. But Paul persevered and stuck to his core beliefs that we could make MIT a place where a diverse student body could succeed. By the time he completed his presidency, there was a sea change in the environment with significantly more minority and women undergraduates. He drove MIT to be a welcoming and successful place for a diverse undergraduate student body. With Priscilla, they made MIT a more welcoming environment for our undergraduates. They held dinners at Gray House for the entire senior class each year, hosting 70 or more students at a time. He and Priscilla engendered a welcoming spirit and tone that permeated the place in ways that continue to have an everlasting effect on the entire community. How does one summarize the life of a man who with so much dedication did so much for this institution in that effort, I was reminded of the spirit of a verse that is often used in a Jewish memorial service. For the creativity, quality, and care in his teaching, <clears throat> we remember him. For his leadership, guidance, and calming influence in times of strife, 
We remember him for strengthening our sense of community, for making MIT a place of trust and honesty. We remember him <clears throat> for his encouragement, support, and championship for the work of others. We remember him for his friendship. We remember him for his commitment, <clears throat> concern for, and dedication to the environment for our students. We remember him for his leadership, drive, and commitment for attracting more women and minority students and to assuring that they concede, succeed here, we remember him for all of his efforts and commitment to MIT, to which he so, only, so fondly referred to as this special place, we remember him. Today we gather to honor and celebrate my dad. And I thank all of you for being here. This event <clears throat> means so much to my mother and the Gray family. On a point of perspective, I would like to point out, however, that this is more than a celebration of a life well lived. If we are to honor my father and what he meant to this institution, we must also recognize what this institution meant to him. I think that today we gather to celebrate MIT as well. We've heard it several times today. My dad called MIT this special place. I think that all of us here today are blessed in some special, precious way. Whether you teach, learn, research, administrate, clean, maintain, or facilitate the workings of the school in some non-academic way, or just love someone who does or did, I think that it's hard not to be touched by the power and promise of MIT. I grew up in a house where we did not know the position of the Red Sox in the ALE standings. I did not know what the Stanley Cup was until the Globe published that iconic photograph of Bobby Orr parallel to the ice. But I did know who had won the Nobel Prizes and what schools they worked at. <laughs> Shortly after Dad's passing, when my cell phone dinged, you know those noises, alert noises, with the news alert that Dr. Rainer Weiss had won this year's prize in physics, along with two of his colleagues from another school that shall not be named. <laughs> I had to smile. This would have pleased Dad so much. If Dad were alive and we were in <clears throat> an earlier, better day, the race would have been on to see if I could get the news to him before he heard. Of course, I would have lost that race. MIT always had better communications technology. <laughs> I believe that a big part of what made MIT so special for my dad was that it was the land of his heroes. 
for the great kids, or the core four, as we like to call ourselves. This aspect of my dad's life was completely transparent and open. These incredible people were also the titans in our lives. I visited Doc Edgerton in his lab. We saw her image tonight, and I think I've heard her name mentioned at least three times tonight. But I used to spend weekends doing chores with Dr. Margaret McVicker on her farm. And in high school, I spoke with Dr. Jerry Wiesner when I waited for dad in the suite of offices that they shared almost every day. And perhaps most importantly, our big brother, Jim Taylor, class of 65, taught us kids the Texas two-step. <laughs> when my family was last all together, we gathered at Hancock Church in remembrance of dad. On that day, Dr. Reif flew in from welcoming his third grandchild to this world to make sure that he was there to sit with my mother. Dr. Jackson, another touchstone in the tapestry of my father's life, was also there from great distance to be with my mother. And of course, Jim Taylor, who had flown in upon my dad's passing to spend three days with my mother, had returned. It would be impossible to adequately express the gratitude of my family for all of you and the countless colleagues, friends, and students. We are profoundly grateful for all that you have done for my dad, both in life and in death. MIT truly is this special place. It's its people that make it so. As I prepared to speak today, I thought about different approaches to these comments. Ultimately, the most visceral lesson of these past few months was what a humbling experience it has been. Humbling to see Dad go. Humbling to see him make it okay for us. Humbling to realize that my thinking, that the inevitable cannot be escaped, and that I was okay with all of this was mere arrogance. Humbling to realize that I don't have any wisdom except to recommit to being the best father, husband, brother, son, colleague, and school guy I can be. With your for forbearance, I would like to share what I presented at Hancock Church a couple months ago. It best contains what I want to tell you about my dad, and I think my mom liked it. <laughs> so we're going to do it again. Um, I once asked my dad what the single most important decision of his career at MIT was. And as Dr. Wilson just shared with us, when asked that question, he said the decision to move the women onto campus here at MIT and get rid of that dorm was the turning point for this school and that closing that dorm set MIT on its path to what it was to become. Such a simple thing, such a powerful thing. As a kid, I learned to love curry at the Mukherjee's and tempura at the Iwasas. At MIT events, dinners hosted at home by my mother and the all important, wonderful, memorable Thanksgivings with dad's advisees. We met people from all across America and all around the world. 
Mom and dad took us to live in northern Wales and we toured Europe when dad had a break. My parents came back from MIT trips to places like India, Egypt, Mexico, China, Japan, and shared the wonder of what they had seen and learned. The point I would like to make is that my parents worked diligently and intentionally to expose us to a world that was as big as MIT. It was clear to us that they valued diversity in all its forms and that engaging with and learning from the broadest possible group of people was something to be treasured and valued as a source of profound strength. As I matured, whether it was because I was old enough to hear certain stories or whether because I started paying attention and linking things up that we did not really talk about as a family, I came to understand that based on the context and the value system that my dad was raised in, he would have seemed a very unlikely champion of diversity. After my kids were born, I decided that I need to ask my dad about this. How had his values in this regard varied so widely from what he knew as a child? While splitting wood down at Little Compton with him, I tried to nicely frame my central question, which boiled down to, hey dad, how come you didn't turn out to be a bigot? <laughs> so I asked. And he put down the mole, took off his gloves, wiped his brow, and he thought. He told me, well, I guess it just never made any sense to me. He put his gloves back on, and we went back to work. <laughs> such a simple thing, such a powerful thing. As a dyslexic kid that did not learn to read until the good folks at the Carroll School taught me to, mainstream standardized academic success was a stranger to me. I failed kindergarten. Not an easy thing to do. I got bounced out of chemistry as a junior in high school because the whole mole thing completely eluded me. And I only graduated from high school because Rosemary Sauerman of Hancock Church intensively tutored me in German and helped me eke out a 60.25% average for the year. It was not really until college and more particularly graduate school where I was able to play to my strengths that I experienced solid academic success and truly enjoyed school. Now juxtapose that with my dad. Clearly, one of the best and most talented minds that many of us will know in our lifetimes. He could have crushed me with a simple, ill-chosen word. He never did. To be clear, there were no free passes in the gray house. All report cards were reviewed with dad and discussed in detail. But dad always threaded that needle between exhorting me to do my best and holding me accountable while building my confidence and honoring my success in the face of adversity. I am profoundly grateful for that. I can remember MIT events and gatherings where well-intentioned people would ask me what I was gonna study when I went to MIT. MIT was clearly not on my life choice menu, nor did it align with my strengths and interests. I remember one particularly robust grilling by an alumni of my father's generation who clearly thought that the son of Paul Gray must be a regular chip off the old block and ready to take MIT by storm. As this gentleman talked, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my dad, and as I focused on him, he gave me his, <clears throat> I am proud of you, smile. 
Such a simple thing. Such a powerful thing. Dad was often asked for advice on how to be successful. His response was consistent. He would suggest that you need to find what interested you most and commit yourself to it fully, and the rest would take care of itself. At a very real level, this was extremely uncomfortable advice. Wouldn't it be easier if there were just a school to attend? a few courses to take, or books to read. Dad's advice was premised on self-awareness, thinking for yourself, as well as being accountable to yourself. My dad spent, with the exception of his service with the Army, of which he was extremely proud, his entire career at MIT. I don't know if you all know this about him, but he never wrote a resume. <laughs> I once asked him to look at a resume that I'd written, and he said, I really don't know much about that. You have to ask someone else. <laughs> he served MIT with devotion and passion and was blessed with the opportunity to leave his mark on the institution at every step of his career. Clearly, each day of his life, my dad relentlessly lived the advice he so often gave. Such a simple thing, such a powerful thing. Oddly, in thinking about all the times I heard him asked about success, I never heard anyone ask him for advice on how to be happy. Of course, I believe he would have given essentially the same answer, but just extended the scope to include a spouse and all the family love and power that arises from and around the union of two people. I believe that if asked, all the core four would tell you that my father's devotion to my mother and of course hers to him, has provided the foundation and the framework for the lives that we and our kids live today. A father's love, such a simple thing, such a powerful thing. Thank you.
My name is Larry Bacow, class of 72. And like many of the people in this room, I was a student of Paul's. However, it was not in course six. Rather, Paul helped to teach me how to be a university president. Shortly after I was named president of Tufts, Paul told me what my new life would be like. Running a research university, he said, was like trying to drive an 18-wheeler down an icy, hilly mountain road with multiple hairpin turns, no guardrails, and 1,000-foot drop-offs. And if that wasn't hard enough, faculty have their hands on the wheel, students have their foot on the accelerator, and alumni have their foot on the brake. <laughs> and you are responsible for the outcome. Paul had a pithy way of making his point. I was to receive all sorts of good advice from him as I prepared to leave the comfortable surroundings of MIT for the wilds of Medford. <laughs> Before you meet with anyone, ask yourself, whose job are you doing now? Very good advice for a university president, right? Shirley and Susan. Um, one of Paul's favorites. He used to say, you know, you need to pat people 10 times on the back for every time you kick them in the rear. <laughs> Nothing succeeds like a successor. Very true. <laughs> if you can't get your work done in 24 hours in a day, start working nights. And Adele's favorite, and Priscilla, she's sh sorry she can't be here with me today, but her absolute favorite. On any given night, you will have four or five invitations, so you're going to be disappointing three or four different people or groups. My advice to you, at least one night a week, disappoint all of them. <laughs> I could go on. David Reisman, the Harvard sociologist and student of higher education, used to say that university presidents become the living, walking logos of their institutions. In reflecting upon this statement, I don't think any president of any institution ever represented the values of the place better than Paul did here. Paul Gray was MIT. He was incredibly smart, but also incredibly modest. He was tough, but caring. He took his work seriously, but never himself. He was comfortable greeting heads of state, but fundamentally, he was blue collar. He was also refreshingly unpretentious. What other college president adopted as their email address a character from a Walt Kelly comic strip, pogo at mit.edu? As Paul used to say, pogo was his favorite philosopher. Paul also had a fabulous sense of humor. He seemed to have just the right story for every occasion. I cannot tell you how many times I have repeated his story about the Russian peasant encountering an almost frozen bird. You all have heard the story. It ends with the three lessons. I'm not going to repeat them here. Ask me at the reception. He also had no difficulty showing emotion. When Paul was angry, you knew it. I recall sitting, but he also had a softer side. And that is really what I think defined Paul. I recall sitting right here in Kresge Auditorium when Paul gave a very moving eulogy for our colleague, Jim Culleton. Jim, as many of you may recall, died well before his time. Paul, in that eulogy, described how closely he worked with Jim and Constantine Simonides, another one of our colleagues who we lost well too soon how they worked so hard to try and hold this place together during the time of student protests in the late 1960s. 
As, as Paul recalled their work together, he described the three of them as a band of brothers. And when he did so, he choked up. He loved Jim, and he loved Constantine, and he was not afraid to say it, and he was not afraid to show it. There was nothing phony about Paul. He was the one of the most real people I have ever been privileged to know. A number of other speakers have already described, described Paul's extraordinary efforts to make MIT a better place for women and for minorities. What is less well known on this campus is that Paul was also a voice for gender diversity and inclusion at Priscilla's alma mater, Wheaton College. At the same time he was president of MIT, Paul chaired the Wheaton College Board of Trustees. To this day, I cannot imagine how anybody could have done both jobs simultaneously, but Paul did. And as board chair, Paul helped to bring co-education to Wheaton, a hugely controversial decision at the time, hugely controversial. Wheaton, however, is the thriving, vibrant college that it is today in no small measure to Paul's steady and strong leadership of that board for his willingness to always do the right thing, as has been said before, even when it was very, very hard. But my enduring image of Paul will always be of him walking hand in hand with Priscilla across this campus. Priscilla, his love of you knew no bounds. Thank you for sharing him with us for so many years. And thank you for all the two of you gave to what Paul, as we've heard many, many times, always called this special place. What makes it so special is because people like you and Paul. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this very special ceremony today. My name is Virginia, and I'm deeply grateful to President Rife for making space in today's ceremony and tribute for a family perspective on and a set of stories about my father's life by him allowing Andrew and me to speak. Since MIT was central to dad's life and love and drive, it was central to ours also especially as we grow up in and around campus, meeting a wide and fascinating swath of God's people, and always being stretched to learn and to grow and to include the myriad people that our parents thought of as family too. My mother and all our parents' children, in-law children, grandchildren and their spouses, and great-grandchild are my father's first family. MIT and the community here is his second. My father lived his life full tilt in incredibly inclusive, intentional, compassion, compassionate, and wholehearted ways. Dad lived life in ways that left no doubt about who he loved, what he cared for, who he stood with, what he stood for, who and what he was willing to work hard for, how he felt about all of us, and what he hoped his life would say after he was gone. He was passionate about his family at home and his family in this special place, and he loved the connections between the two. My father squeezed so very much out of all of his days here on earth. 
He was fully present to us, and his life had purpose, passion, and focus. Dad was all in. He used his time, talent, and treasure for good. And even though we can't really quite yet believe that he is gone, I'm going to share first on behalf of my amazing and remarkable sisters. Amy first, and these are her words. Dad took us, especially me and Virginia, all over the White Mountains and Snowdonia. Such happy memories on the trails, beautiful scenery and views from the top. There was a kind of magic about getting up really early, driving to near the mountain, stopping for breakfast, and then doing the climb. And since food is always important to us Grays, the lunches and snacks were awesome. <laughs> Things we didn't usually have. I remember chocolate bars and juicy orange sections in particular. The days were the start of my deep love affair with the great outdoors. My own family made camping and hiking a foundation of our life together. I keep thinking about all the woodworking that Daddy has done with all of us over the years. I remember the day when I was little, probably eight or nine years old, when he came home from MIT with a glass-fronted bookcase that was being thrown out from a library at MIT. We turned it into my dollhouse. We put wall partitions in and wallpapered and painted. Of course, we even put electricity in as well. <laughs> it ran on a very large battery. I made beaded chandeliers, and we used tiny Christmas tree lights for the bulbs. It was so much fun transforming a simple bookcase into something I wanted so much with my father's help. Dad worked with my husband, Dave, on several projects at our house in Kenny Bunk. Together, they rebuilt the screened-in porch from the ground up to the roof. They repaired a very rotten corner of our garage. And over a week, they redid our kitchen, including relocating the stove, rewiring the kitchen, building some new cupboards, and laying new formica on the countertop. Dave loved working with Daddy on these projects. No one had ever done that sort of work with him before. Papa and Stephanie built a bureau together. They started with discussing plans and what she wanted, and then they built the whole thing over a year's time. Stephanie loved it. And I can attest to the fact that the drawer still pulls smoothly. It was very well built. I also know that Dad worked with Hannah and Priscilla on woodworking projects. He loved sharing his skills and his love of woodworking. Working with him over the past few years, it has been very clear to me how generous he was and is. Even as his mind faded, he was always clear about the organizations that he thought were important to support and why. He was also very generous with his time and energy, with the core four going back to childhood, with help on homework or projects, and later with all of our spouses and our children, his grandchildren. He made himself available and present in all our lives. And this was from a man who had lots of other people who wanted his time and attention also. Being together and spending time knowing each other was so important to dad. He and mom fostered the love, friendship, and caring that happens between the 26 of us. I am deeply thankful for my entire family and for the bonds that we share. And I'm deeply grateful to daddy and mom for giving all of us that gift of family. Now, in Louise's words, Wheezy, to get, today we celebrate my dad, grandfather to my children, a supportive and proud father-in-law to my husband, Tim, and a leader at MIT. I want to share memories I have of growing up with dad, Dr. Paul Gray, in our home life and in our MIT life. There was a lot of overlap. We had family Friday date nights, usually Regina's Pizza in the North End or Chinese food or the faculty club in Cambridge followed by big ball bowling at MIT bowling alleys, or swimming at the MIT pool, the old one, which now looks very small. <laughs> we loved visiting Doc Edgerton's lab. MIT day camp was a part of every summer as campers and also many years as counselors for some of us. All 12 grandchildren visited mom and dad in the summer and loved being campers. Over the years, I walked gray way, hand in hand with my siblings, mom and dad, and the grandchildren. The Gray House was our family home for 10 years. It was the welcoming home to countless family gatherings, including three weddings. 
Amy and Dave, Andrew and Yuki, and me and Tim all got married there. The grandchildren loved playing in the, what was known then as the Green Forest, which was a space near the public bathrooms on the bottom floor of the gray house. And we, now the, floor, now the rug is white. <laughs> it's probably lucky the kids have gone. We, have, we had two inaugurations to attend, chancellor and then president, and both were held in the truly amazing great courtyard. I have very many fun memories of Gray House. I spent a lot of time there, more than my siblings, since I am the baby. I went to Lesley University at the other end of Cambridge. I recall coming home one Friday afternoon to go on a date with my dad. I was unaware of the corporation meeting in the large living room on the first floor. I came in singing, anyone home who loves me? <laughs> at the top of my lungs. <laughs> to my surprise and also his, I encountered the treasurer of the corporation at that time in the front hall. He encouraged me to be a little quieter. But dad came around the corner with a giant dad hug. He introduced me to the corporation. He made it comfortable and not so embarrassing for me. He always loved having his kids around to introduce to his MIT family. His love and pride were always tangible. I'm sure all my siblings, our spouses, and the grandchildren will agree that education was highly encouraged. Find your passion, what interests you, what you are good at, and go after it. Don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone either. He encouraged the core four to pursue our degrees and our interests, and mom and dad always encouraged us and our partners to go after their interests. Our endeavors included higher degrees, professional goals, and hobbies. Dad also enjoyed participating in many of our interests with us, including fishing with Tim and Andrew, home improvements, travel, food, wine, hiking and biking, historical field trips, and books on diverse topics. However, I do not believe he ever knitted it with us gray ladies, even though we invited him to join us many times. I want all of you to know that my, my, my dad and mom loved the core four, the four more spouses, and all the grands, just like his own children. And she will conclude by sharing a classic wheezy dad experience and really an iconic family story. Learning to drive with dad was an intense experience at our home. This is still wheezy. Dad was a secret car loving junkie and he took good care of his vehicles. He was also big on being able to follow multi-step directions. Lastly, he taught that a driver needs to just drive. I think I had had some driver's ed classes. I was still very new to driving. I chose the red BMW to drive as a learner with dad. And we were on the Cape on a beautiful morning and he said, let's go for a drive, Louise. He didn't call me Wheezy, he called me Louise. So I think, all right, I have this. All my safety nets are in place. The biggest of which were the bracelets I wore on my left arm, many of them really almost halfway up my arm. They were a tool that Carol School taught me to help remember right from left as a dyslexic kiddo. I got in the car, dad said, you just need to drive, take off the bracelets. I tried to explain my thoughts. He said, they're a distraction, just take them off. Well, we did okay for a while, and then he gave me three directions in a row to follow. Two rights and a left. Well, the last left turned into a right drive <laughs> through a wall of shrubs into a, <laughs> into a backyard pool party. <laughs> I hit the brakes there by causing no damage to the guests. My father looked at me and told me to get the hell out of here. <laughs> Instead of driving down the driveway in front of me, I, I backed out through the shrubs <laughs> that I had just driven through. We went home immediately. We came into the house. There was no yelling. There was no talking. It was still morning. Dad went to the fridge and got a beer. <laughs> I went to the bathroom and threw up. <laughs> After that, whenever I went driving, I, Dad asked if I had my bracelets on. <laughs> Thank you.
I did wear my bracelets, and from that point forward, my sister Virginia, brother Andrew, and mom taught me to drive. <laughs> and as Virginia, I'll tell you that dad did go back that afternoon to the house whose shrubs were damaged <laughs> to make good on the damage. Lastly, from Louise, from September 2014, after my parents moved to Newbury Court till about a year ago, my dad and I had dates almost every Tuesday. Sometimes we did errands for the house and for mom. Sometimes we played. We loved to walk the paths on the freedom trails. Of course, when you spend the morning walking the trails, you need to take in some yummy food. The favorite local destination for my dad was the Colonial Inn in Concord. Burger, fries, and a tall Guinness. We developed the term 10 day. Dad and I had many 10 days. And just for the record, on our Tuesday date days, he told me many times that I was a very good driver. <laughs> and now my words. My father was my hero. I looked up to him and I wanted to be like him from the earliest time I can remember. I was always proud to be his daughter. He encouraged and supported all of us. He challenged and stretched us. He loved and adored my mother, my siblings, and me unconditionally. And despite the pressures and time involved in his work, he made himself emotionally available to us through all the changes and chances of this life. All the way through my high school years, I would finish my homework late, either with him sitting in his study or up in my room. I always had a check-in time with him before bed. He was invariably still up and working at 11 or 12 at night. And when he woke me up at 5 a.m. with a very loud electric buzzer he installed in my third floor bedroom, he loved to lean on that thing. Dad at 5 a.m. was always shaved, showered, and dressed. That was his work ethic. He never complained about his hours or his work. It was just what he did. He often shared stories about encounters that pleased or inspired him at MIT, or a project he was working on that excited him, or how he won a squash game that day. Daddy was passionate about his work and the people he worked alongside. He cared deeply for all the people God put in his path. His principled honesty, openness, and unwavering decency, always on display in his deeds and his words, were a life lesson and a life map for the four of us. My parents welcomed all comers to our home and treated each visiting student or academic like esteemed family. I wanted to be a doctor of medicine when I was in high school. In 1975, I graduated high school and I went to a decent liberal arts college and started the pre-med curriculum. I had done well in high school, but chemistry and math had definitely not been my strong or long suit. And yes, you might see an emerging theme here amongst the children. The first semester of my freshman year was a disaster. The first failing grades I had ever earned in my life were in that semester. I had to drop organic chemistry and, chemistry and I only barely passed calculus because I rode the Greyhound bus home every other weekend so that dad could help me with my problem sets. He sat patiently next to me as I worked the problems, never doing them for me, but helping me see the process and the ways to a solution. That year, during Christmas vacation, Dad sat down with me, and in the most tender and loving way imaginable, he gently suggested that I, and I quote him here, make my studies match my gifts. His words, I took his advice and moved in a different direction. It made Dad smile when I ended up working in healthcare ministry for 15 years, healing work from a different perspective. I know he was proud of me. And he was proud of my husband and offered so much invaluable support and encouragement to Tom as he worked on his PhD. Dad was present when Tom got his degree in May of 2014. And I think Dad was more excited when Tom's book was published than we were. Dad knew what effort and commitment the degree and the book required, and he was delighted. The fact that the book was a history book about engineering made it kind of perfect. <laughs> I want to end by reflecting on my father's character. His excellent, kind, and loyal aide, Fahami, stood over his bed two days before Dad died and said, quote, Paul goes the extra distance, unquote. This was true throughout his life. Dad was our very own resident wise man. He could fix any broken thing, solve any stubborn problem, dry a flood of adolescent girl tears, 
pick the splinters out of our hands and feet, comfort the lovelorn or lonely, design an adventure or plan an amazing trip, help with our math, science, social studies, and English homework, and keep a watchful but low-key eye on our social lives. He fought for real people and authentic inclusion, for equity and justice. He, generally care, he genuinely cared about people and causes, and he had a sturdy, steady, solid, no-nonsense-with-a-twinkle way about him. The first time I ever saw my father cry was when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. The second time was when he had to put our first family dog down. Dad was part terrier, part bulldog, part teddy bear. He never expected anything of us that he didn't expect of himself, and his generosity knew no limits. Dad was both strict and fair. He was often reserved, but his natural way of listening more than he spoke manifested a tender heart and an unparalleled knack for connection and relationship. My father was a man who could be trusted and relied upon in every situation and circumstance of life. And as his granddaughter Caroline puts it, in his, in quote, his knowledge of all the things. Despite dad's success and steadily advancing career, my father was a deeply humble man. He was always more comfortable in yard work clothes than dress up attire. And when he was out in the world, he didn't need to be carefully kept and he didn't crave special attention. He also had a vast appreciation for the people who worked behind the scenes to make things go, and he was fiercely loyal. Two stories demonstrate these qualities. Amy recalls her move-in day at Wheaton College where he had just been appointed the chairman of the board. I quote Amy here, Dad was named chair of the board the summer before I entered Wheaton as a freshman. The day we arrived on campus to drop me off, we pulled into the parking area closest to Stanton Hall where I lived my first year. It was not terribly close, but we were in good company and we were managing. A security officer recognized Dad and said, Dr. Gray, you can pull right up in front of the building. It will be much easier to unload from there. Dad, without a single pause, said, thank you, but we are fine where we are with all the other families. Today, I am the father of an incoming student. Now I quote Martha Milliken, Wheezy's childhood BFF, who is here today. Paul Gray has been a part of my life for a very long time. He was so very gentle and kind to me growing up. My dad wasn't around very much, and Dr. and Mom G took me in as one of their own, and boy, could they cook. In the early years, Paul would come pick me up in the morning so Wheezy and I could go to school together hand in hand. I remember him being concerned that such little people shouldn't walk so far alone. I knew I was a lucky girl. I was often included in Gray family vacations. Overnights at Sheffield Road had two young girls staying up way too late with vast amount of giggling. Overnights at the president's house were always filled with adventure, lots of doors, more good food, and the all-important girl time. After I graduated from college, I worked for Wellington Management, and MIT was one of our firm's first large institutional, was our firm's largest institutional client. Whenever Dr. Gray was coming to Wellington for one of the frequent investment management meetings, there would be a buzz in the building. I was not involved in managing MIT's money, but each and every time that Paul entered the offices, he would make a point of finding me and giving me one of those wonderful bear hugs. He always made time to check on me, and everybody wondered why the president of MIT was finding Martha, sometimes bearing flowers or taking her out to dinner. I knew it was because I was a lucky girl and he was a lovely man. There is a view out there in the world that says that whoever we are is accentuated by our aging. I believe that this is largely true. Watching what disease did to our father over the past seven years is one of the cruelest things that I have ever witnessed. However, as Alzheimer's disease slowly robbed and stripped our father of his brilliance, competence, intellect, vast knowledge, problem-solving skills, woodworking gifts, and love of reading, writing, and teaching. The essential daddy or Paul still remained with his dignity intact. The man who loved people, who was humble to his very core. The joyful, gentle man, the teddy bearish man who trusted God, who lit up whenever his wife, a child, including his in-law children, or a grandchild walked into the room the friendly, hospitable, and open gentleman who gave hugs or stuck out his hand whether or not he could remember the person standing in front of him, 
the sweet and affectionate father, dedicated mentor and colleague, devoted to his colleagues and his school, this man was with us to the very end of his life. Maybe it is impolitic to say this here at MIT, which is an international leader of scientific research and is at the forefront of all things tech, but I'm gonna say it anyway. My father was a man of faith. He knew God's grace and he knew Jesus' name. He always thought that the arguments between sacred scripture and science were a silly tangent. Dad perceived the spark of the divine in the work of scientists and engineers across the institute and in the best of human collaboration and concentrated effort to discover, invent, learn, teach, share, and advance anew, Dad saw the hand of God at work. Because he worshiped a loving God and was a keen observer of human beings and behaviors, he also knew that sometimes we sabotage ourselves. Larry pointed out his email address. We have met the enemy and he is us. Pogo, his favorite tagline. Dad knew and understood that to be human is to experience a million Good Friday moments, moments of sadness, challenge, betrayal, hardship, suffering, and pain. But Dad also knew a resurrection Jesus, the Lord of love and light and love, and, and love, light, and life the Lord who revealed by his living and his dying and by rising again that death does not have the last word. Darkness does not prevail. Love always wins. There are risks to being human. Accidents and illness and tragedy unfold. Bodies get old and disease happens. Beloved ones die and the world seems to shift and we wonder if we can move forward. But the truth of my father's faith is that love never dies. Relationship changes, but does not end. We carry our deceased loved ones forward in our hearts in the way we live and remember and celebrate. We don't say goodbye. We say until we meet again. I saw God over and over again in these last painful years of my father's life. I saw God and the care and love our mother extended to dad every waking minute, every single day. I saw it in the care and love that this extraordinary community of MIT extended to dad and mom and to us as dad's health failed. God was in the small intermittent moments of connection, spark, joy, and recognition that dad savored right to the end of his life. The last week of his life, as we waited and watched and sat vigil, now looks a lot like a parting gift from dad, the gift of connection and love between our mother, the core four, the four more, and the extended and beloved tribe of grandchildren who are more like siblings than cousins. Memories and stories, tears and laughter, good food prepared and shared, favorite stories read aloud, and lots of hugs and handholding prepared all of us to let go. It takes a village to raise a child. It turns out it also takes a village to help an elder die with dignity and in comfort and to help the bereaved family move forward. You are all key parts of our village. Thank you for all you have done to support my father and mother and our family on this final leg of my father's journey. Thank you for the gift of your presence and esteem, for the gift of your love and devotion. Thank you for showing us love over and over in ways that will sustain us and carry us forward in the days to come. May our cherished father and your cherished leader rest in peace. And may we honor him, Paul, Dad, Dr. Gray. May we honor him and his legacy by our love, by our character and our compassion, by our courage and our conviction, by our willingness to do good in the world by always telling the truth, and by our commitment to family, community, honest, hard work, and all of God's people. Amen.
Hi, I'm Bob Millard, the 11th chairman of MIT's corporation. Paul's roots at MIT run deep and they run wide. He came here in 1950. That was the same year I was born. And from that point forward, whether as an undergraduate or a graduate student or a professor or a chancellor, associate provost, president, chairman, advisor, or mentor, Paul has had been an integral, active, and important part of MIT's fabric. In fact, his presence here spanned almost half of MIT's entire existence. And while that statistic alone is amazing, it doesn't begin to reflect all that Paul meant to us through his friendship and his leadership, his wisdom, his foresight, and his energy, and, and his youth. There's some here who may not have had the joy of knowing Paul personally, and there are and will be many, many more in the future who will be denied that honor. Nonetheless, we are and ever will be the common beneficiaries of his good work and his good life. That is, I believe, what it means to have done so much to build and nourish this great institution of MIT. We're grateful that Paul's family continues to be part of MIT, and it's an honor to acknowledge and thank, and to thank them, Paul's wife, Priscilla, his son, Andrew, and his daughter, Virginia. I'd like to thank Raphael, Shirley, Victor, Jim, Susan, Gerald, Andrew, Larry, Virginia, for their poignant reflections, as well as Marcus and David for the beautiful music. I'd also like to thank the MIT police and the MIT ROTC for their presentations of the flags. I'd like to invite all of you to join Paul's family in the Kresge Oval for reception at the conclusion of this service. And I think it's now, I want to introduce the MIT Corollaries who will sing the school song in Paul's honor. And I'd like to thank the students for being here and invite everyone to join with them during the second verse. Thank you. Oh. 